who do you think is the greatest player of all time? You've talked in, from different angles on this. Uh, Magnus Carlsen, Gary Kaspara, Bobby Fischer, uh, many others. Can, can you make the case for each? Um, can, you, I, can, I, can you make the case for you? Uh, no, I mean I can't make the case for me. Be serious. Right. I, I know, I know there are a lot of people who want want that kind of like me to give off some kind of ego like that. But no, um, obviously I'm nowhere near the conversation. I, I actually, on that note, I would say also I know people wanted to know if I'm the uh, greatest player to never have played for the world championship or to have not got not become world champion. I don't think that I'm actually anywhere near the top of that conversation. I actually think Levon Aronian tops that conversation by a big margin simply because he was number two in the world for a very, very long time. And he, he never even got to the match. So as far as world champions and who's the goat, I think, um, I think Magnus is the goat simply because he's playing the best chess by by a by a bigger margin, he has the highest elo of all time. Uh, on the other hand, chess is a game where you know you build upon you build upon the giants of the past. We're, we're, we learn we learn from them, and so you can definitely make the case for Gary as well. I mean, he was the number one player in the world for twenty plus years. A lot of opening strategies he came up with, and our people still play them today. Bobby, I'm not so sure you can really make that case because he was he he shot up really quickly, but he was the world champion for a very short window of time, and then he he quit the game as soon as he became world champion. So I don't really feel like you can put Fisher in that uh, in that conversation simply because he didn't have that longevity at all. He was he was up there for a couple of years. So I would say it's probably Magnus, but I understand people can also say Gary's Gary's the best player ever. Um, remains to be seen, but I think if Magnus is number one for probably another, let's say another three to four years, I don't think there's any debate at all. Can you break down what makes him so good? We've already talked about different angles of this, sure. and then I would also <laughs> uh, try to get the same from you, because we talked about early Hikaru. Like, I'd, I'd like to uh, talk about that fuller, but first Magnus, what makes Magnus so good? What are the various aspects of his game that make him so good? I think for Magnus, he he just you know that in the end game in the end games, if you get there, he's just he's not gonna blunder. That's the first thing. So you know if you reach an end game, he's not gonna make a mistake. He obviously plays great openings, and there's just really no defined weakness that he has. There's no weakness that I can think of very specifically. Um many there are many times where players actually out prepare him in the opening phase, but as soon as they're on their own and they have to think, very oftentimes they'll make mistakes. Um so there's just no weakness for Magnus, really no weakness. Unlike, say, Kasparov, like Kasparov, on the other hand, there there are very clear weaknesses um, in his game, like Kramnik exploited them. First of all, very, I don't want to say like ego is the right word, but like very stubborn, believing that his openings were infallible, that he could just win, he, he could just prove an advantage and win the game out of the opening, like against Kramnik when he ultimately lost. Also generally not a great defender either, very strong tactically, but if he was in positions that were defensive, he would make mistakes and lose in end games, like he did in one of those uh, games in the World Championship against Kramnik. So there were very clear defined weaknesses in Kasparov's game. Um, whereas like Magnus, there just there are no clearly defined weaknesses. Maybe maybe he doesn't like being attacked. Maybe that's the one thing he likes king safety and he doesn't like being attacked. But that's not something that you can easily do. Whereas say. Uh, if someone's very tactical and they're not as strong positionally, that is something you can def that will happen quite frequently in games. You can steer games a certain way. Doesn't mean you'll always get there, but that, that is something tangible. Whereas king safety, that's not something tangible at all. It's very, very hard to attack someone uh, based on unless they play a certain style of openings. Do you think uh, Gary Kasparov, reflecting in your comment, would agree? Like, what is it about his relationship <laughs> with with Kremnik that? was so challenging. I mean, I think it's because Kramnik understood him. Actually, one thing that's funny, speaking of Kasparov, is that I think it got under his skin. Like, when I worked with him, Kramnik actually would play a certain style, very, like, very aggressive, very sort of risky opening play during the time when I was when I was working with Gary. And I know that it annoyed Gary because he's like, why couldn't Kramnik play like this against me? Mm -hmm. Because I think Gary felt if Kramnik did that against him, he would have just blown him off the board and had, had, had many great victories. So I think it's Kramnik understood Gary. They had worked together, I think, during during the late 90s. I think Gary actually was very useful or very helpful in terms of Kramnik getting a spot on one of the uh, Russian chess Olympiad teams in, in, in the mid-90s. So I think it's just Kramnik understood him very well. And Gary just could not, 
He just, he, he couldn't figure it out. And I think also another thing coming back to the psycho- psychological part is that Kramnik actually beat Kasparov in many games in the Kings Indian defense. Kasparov played the Kings Indian defense for many years and they started losing like four or five games in a row in it to Kramnik, very similar to what I mentioned about the Sicilian Nidorf and Fabiano. And Gary gave it up. He started switching to playing the Grunfeld defense. And so I think that also instilled some psychological fear as well because Gary was, he was the boss. In openings, no one could compare to him. What makes you so good? What uh, what what's the breakdown of the strengths and weaknesses of Fikaru Nakamura? So that's I think probably my biggest strength is that I'm a universal player. I can play pretty much any opening strategy. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, beyond that, I think it's mainly that. I don't really make many blunders. I don't make blunders unless I'm under a lot of pressure generally. So that, I mean, I know I'm, I'm oversimplifying. It's not as, as simple as that. Does this apply to blitz, uh, uh, to blitz as well? I think it's much more applicable to blitz, uh, in particular because my intuition is very good. So when I'm making less blunders with limited time on the clock, my opponents actually make a lot more blunders. That that's why I think it's much more pronounced in blitz than it is in classical chess, because in blitz, when you're down to like 10 seconds uh, in the game, both players have 10 seconds, my intuition is just better than theirs. I mean, Magnus maybe not so clear, but like if you look at other players, say Fabiano Caruana, a very strong player, when he gets down to 10 seconds or in these these uh, these situations, he almost always makes a blunder, almost always. Um, so I'm just more precise. I make less blunders. And that that's really, the, the effect is much more dramatic in Blitz. What do you think that intuition is? Like, um, sorry for the kind of, uh, like almost philosophical question. What what is that? Is that is that calculation, or is it some kind of weird memory re- recall? What is that? Like being able to do that short line prediction. I think that's just playing so many games online, and there's some kind of subconscious feel that, that I have. Because when you're that low on time, you can't calculate. It's just you have to look. You just have to figure out what's the move you want to play is. No calculation and just go with it. And I think just playing so many games, probably. I mean, I'm guessing I've played over three hundred thousand games mm-hmm. online. And I think just playing all those games, it's it's a feel. There's there's no tangible way uh, that, that I can't put that really into words. It's just a feel. What do you visual? And we should say that you're, I think, currently the number one ranked blitz player in the world. You have uh, been for a while, you're unquestionably one of the great. So the classical, uh, rapid, and blitz, you're one of the best people for many years in the world. Okay, but you're currently number one in blitz. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of, for you to dig into the secret to your success in, in blitz. Is it, as you're saying, that intuition, being able to, when the time is short, to not make blunders and then to make a close to optimal move? I think it's generally that I'm able to keep the games going no matter what until we're low on time. I'm always able to do that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Like if we play a game with three minutes, like there, there are games I will just win, win very quickly, but a lot of games between top players, players have to think you have to use time. And in those final critical stages, I just don't blunder. I I just don't blunder really at the end of the day. That's, that's really the only difference because everybody's very, very strong. But it's sort of like who is the who is the better like brain who is the better like CPU or for lack of a better way of putting it it's like who makes a split to sec, split second decisions the best and uh, I do think that I'm extremely good at that in a way that almost nobody else is that that really is the only difference is that the split second decisions because you can get a worse position but again if you keep the game going players have to use the time when you get down to those final 10, 15 seconds. Uh, I almost always end up winning in those situations. What are you visualizing? Like what in those when you're doing the fast, fast calculations? What what is it? Um it's basically you look at a move and you see like when it's like five seconds or ten seconds, you play a move and you just make sure that it's not a blunder. You just look, make sure it's not a blunder, and you just go with it. And the first part though is the feel. So it's like I see this move and it looks right. I don't know why it's right. I can't put that into words, but it looks like the right move. And then I look very for like a split second, see as long as it's not some kind of blunder and you just play that move. Is there a bit of a tunnel vision? Are you able to understand the positions of all the other pieces on the board? Or are you just focusing in on a very specific interaction? It's just feel. It's really just feel. It's like this move feels right. And so I play it. When you're, when you're at that stage of the game, it's it's like as long as it's not a blunder and it, it just that it's just that feel. There's th- There is no way for me to put that in. And that feel like empirically does result in low probability of blunder for you. 
Yeah. So like you don't blunder. Yeah. Even though there could be like you don't forget like a random piece that was like very very I mean it does happen of course, but very rarely and I mean I've done it on stream many times. Like it's just you you go with the move that for whatever reason, like it just you, intuitively whether it's from playing hundreds of thousands of games on the internet um, or just that that experience, like it, you just intuitively can can feel like the move is right. 